Good morning, everybody. I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C., uh, and I am today providing a situational update on the district's response to COVID-19, and then we will uh, take a few questions. I am joined today by a special guest, Jaden Settles. Hi, Jaden, and welcome. Uh, Jada wrote, uh, Jada won the citywide I Mask for DC video um, in a video festival and contest. And today we're gonna show her very impressive video that she made that explains why it's so important for people to wear masks right now. The competition was led by um, five of our community partners, the ARC Theater, Howard University's Department of Theater Arts, the Washington Informer, WHUR, and WPFW. So we wanna thank all of those uh, sponsors. And in just a few minutes, we're gonna watch uh, Jaden's video. Uh, so as I said last week, we are encouraging DC residents and people in the area uh, to celebrate the 4th of July, um, either from home or close to home. And so today we want to review some of our guidance on private gatherings. I'm joined by members of my team uh, and we will be happy to uh, answer your questions. The guidance for hosting and attending private gatherings can be found at coronavirus.dc.gov backslash phase two. coronavirus.dc.gov backslash phase two. Two, And so as we prepare for the holiday weekend, I will continue to remind Washingtonians that this virus still exists, it's still circulating, uh, and you could contract the virus in any of your uh, activities. So today uh, we announced 35 new cases, uh, and we are clearly um, very um, encouraged by how we have blunted the curve in DC, uh, also in Maryland and Virginia, but we know that we are still reporting new cases, so we have to continue uh, to be vigilant. Uh, we uh, know from health professionals that outdoor, outdoor activities are preferred over indoor activities, but that the virus can still spread uh, in the outdoors as well. So if you are hosting um, people this weekend or if you're going to someone else's home, even if everyone is outside, you still need to consider how much space people will have to social distance and don't invite more people than you have the space for. And if you are invited to a gathering, um, but you get there and realize that it isn't safe to socialize, it's not, it's not safe for people to social distance, then you may need to make new plans for yourself and your family to keep uh, yourself safe. So remember uh, when making your guest list and inviting guests that you have to space to accommodate everyone safely. Uh, and this may lead us all to a kind of a, a new set of questions to ask um, when we're invited someplace else. And this may seem awkward. Um, you may have already done it. I certainly have done it. Uh, when being invited someplace, just simply asking who else is going to be there? How many people are going to be there? And um, making sure that even your host knows um, everyone who is going to be there. And everyone uh, needs to be responsible. If you invite people over uh, in the, on the day of the event, if someone in your household doesn't feel well, you have to cancel the event. Furthermore, you should remind your guests um, if they aren't feeling well, um, then they should not uh, come to the event. We all miss our family and friends, but in order to protect each other, we need to stay home uh, if we feel sick. One cookout is not worth um, people getting sick that you care about uh, and people that they care about getting infected um, with the virus. So remember, uh, your wellness on the day of the event uh, and the wellness of your guests on the day of the event is paramount 
to an event proceeding or to their attending the event. If you're hosting, discourage people from gathering in groups. Also, keep a list of your guests uh, in case it's needed for contact tracing. Ensure that your guests can practice proper hand hygiene. So have soap and water available, have hand sanitizer available. Uh, limit the use of shared items. Um, so consider that uh, with all of everything that's used for hand washing um, to getting food and drinks, uh, try to limit the use of shared items. Also consider providing cleaning supplies for your guests to wipe down and sanitize shared surfaces such as handles uh, and uh, bathroom items. Of course, we also want to remind you, if you feel sick or think you were exposed to the virus, you should get tested. And here is the testing schedule for the rest of this week. Our citywide testing sites will be closed on Friday and Saturday. So if you plan to go to one of the district supported testing sites, please plan accordingly and go uh, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then our citywide sites will reopen again on Monday. Our grocery and meal sites will also be closed on Friday in observation of the holiday. So we are encouraging residents who need to pick up groceries to do so um, between uh, now and Thursday. Uh, so before we begin Jaden's video, I want to reiterate uh, that there are very simple steps that everyone can take to protect yourself, to protect others, and to protect our city. Uh, and that is to wear a mask, keep six feet distance between you and other people, and to choose your activities wisely. When you go out, ask yourself, do I really need to be there? Uh, and with that, we're going to see uh, Jaden's video. COVID-19 is a killer, and it's killing black people at a higher rate. We make up 75% of COVID deaths in D.C., but we can change that. COVID-19 is passed through droplets and suspended particles in the air. That's why wearing a mask is critical. Face masks combined with physical distancing would help reopen the economy more safely and crush a second or third COVID wave. Wear a mask for your family, friends, and you. Jaden, you want to come up and tell us about your video? Um, hi, my name is Jaden Settles, um, and as you can see, I created that video. Um, I learned how to do this from my mother, who works in distance learning. Um, and it's really fun making animations and things of the sort, especially since these are easily um, understandable and create, can create awareness of uh, different subjects, especially like this. And since I live with both of my grandparents and have you know people who have passed away from the virus and who have been cured from the virus, um, it was really uh, nice for me to create this video. Um, and uh, it was important for me to educate myself, even though I am only 14 and just graduated from the eighth grade, I educated myself on how to um, prevent catching the virus and how to choose wisely when I decide to go out and do certain things, so. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Jaden. Um, I, I went to Aspen Middle School, and I was attending Banneker High School. Banneker Academic High School, she's going to be attending. Okay, you just went what school? Uh, Aspen Middle School. Aspen, okay. All right, any questions? Questions? Yes, Sam. Yes, Mayor. Um, I, I got a number of questions, but uh, I'll start with the uh, fireworks. Sure. Uh, we, 
we did a story yesterday on the fireworks vendors who basically were upset because uh, the city allowed Costco to sell fireworks and nobody else. Um, and one what, what of the points they made was that you encourage people to stay home. Um, and it, it's more difficult if you don't have a Costco card or you don't, uh, uh, let's say, you don't want to buy illegal fireworks out of the back of somebody's car. Uh, license dealers were denied this year. Uh, I saw the letter from DCRA. They cited uh, basically the COVID situation and social unrest. If it's, you know, a problem for Costco, why is it a, why is it a problem for the rest of them? The social unrest is it's a problem. Well, Sam, I think you know this is um, a matter that's being heard in court right now, um, and we're, we're going to address it there. And I do think that the license applications got caught up in our essential or non-essential business and our, our move through the phases. And so that was one uh, check that the agency has. So I think that we're going to uh, resolve, uh, be able to resolve it, but we are participating in a court hearing today. So, so there's hope for these vendors? Um, I think that we, I don't know what's going to happen in court right now, so I can't, I can't speak to it, but we are participating in that process. And just like other retailers were um, not able to function as they normally would because of stay-at-home orders and slowly turning on stay-at-home orders, uh, these retailers that are kind of a pop-up retail that we license to build um, these sheds, basically, the temporary um, retail locations, uh, were impacted by those closures. So you're saying basically that uh it wasn't intended necessarily for them, but they got caught up in it? Is that the, the essence of it? I'm saying it was part of a, an extra review because we were, or I think at the time that those applications were made, we were not in a regular retail posture. And we're still, we still aren't. Um, our retailers are still being limited um, to how they can uh, operate. Okay, but you said you're working to resolve uh, we will continue to have some discussions based on today's court proceedings. Can I ask another question? Yes, of course. Black Lives Matter Plaza, one of the things that a number of uh, folks at, at my place have been asking is, is this a, uh, we saw some video the other night, I guess the police moving uh, a tent or something like this. So you know, what are the rules there? Is it a place you cannot put up a tent, you cannot stay. Um, you cannot camp anywhere in the District of Columbia. That's against the law anywhere in the District of Columbia camping. And this, this Black Lives Matter Plaza, is this something that is permanent, temporary? What, what can you say about it? Well, we are working with our business improvement districts, not just on um, the street naming, which has been made in law, uh, the artwork, the artwork around it in the, the physical realm itself. Um, and so we will work with our business improvement district, the property owners there, arts community, um, to make some final plans for the plaza. But it's, for, for now, how would you characterize it? protest zone? Or? No, I've never <laughs> characterized it that way. It's 16th Street in the District of Columbia that is open uh, to anybody um, as long as they're peaceful and lawful. And are you going to paint over the yellow wording? Uh, as, as I just mentioned, Sam, we are going to continue to work on how it will be preserved in a permanent way uh, with more discussions with um, the community. And so it will, those discussions will not only include the artwork, um, but uh, also the, the surrounding physical realm. Finally, on this point, uh, it did look like kind of a rough confrontation between the police and the, the people who were, who were there. Is that, does that concern you at all? Well, I, I, I've learned that looking at these videos, sometimes you need to see what happens before it. Um, and so I know that the police were responding. Um, we want to remind everybody to follow the instructions of, of the police. Uh, and certainly our, in, our department investigates any uh, use of force. So they will look at that closely. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, Mayor Bowser, may I have a question for Dr. Nesbitt? Yes. Dr. Uh, ne yeah, Dr. Nesbitt, uh, Deborah Burks and uh, Dr. Powell, she talk about an uptick in the fall in terms of uh, the coronavirus and as well as the flu. And uh, while the district is doing good right now, are, is your department prepared if a second wave comes into the city uh, in the fall? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there are a number of things that we are doing uh, in communicating with our healthcare partners, uh, as well as our phased approach that we have outlined uh, in uh, working and communicating with the Reopen DC Advisory Committee and the recommendations that we make to uh, Mayor Bowser. Part of why we are being very cautious and, as some would say, very conservative in terms of a phased reopening is to be able to understand what happens as more activity that typically occurs in the fall uh, when more people are now indoors, uh, when we typically have more respiratory viruses uh, circulating in our community, creating a more complex and complicated picture for us to respond to. Uh, when I mentioned we are doing things now to prepare, uh, we are working with our healthcare provider community in terms of what it looks like to ensure that we have a population that is vaccinated against uh, influenza to decrease the likelihood that we have a, uh, a epidemic related to influenza in our community. We are also working with our healthcare provider community to ensure that our school age population is vaccinated against all vaccine, vaccine preventable illnesses. Uh, we are working with our healthcare community uh, in terms of corresponding and communicating with them in terms of what our healthcare infrastructure looks like in terms of being able to respond to non-COVID related illnesses, uh, those chronic disease management, being able to respond to urgent and emergent issues that are non-COVID related in our community in late summer, in the fall, et cetera. A lot of the planning that we've been doing with our universities and with our businesses helps them to anticipate what could happen in the fall and in the winter. Uh, so a lot of our preparedness efforts uh, not only anticipates what could potentially happen with COVID, but also with influenza in the district. Yes, Julie. Uh, to follow up on that, I'm wondering whether you are concerned about the states that are seeing a real spike right now. Um, have you thought about banning visitors from those southern or western states to the district? Are you concerned about Virginia entering phase three? Uh, so uh, this is not a question that I don't get often. Uh, part of if you are observing the types of activities that we have uh, permitted in phase two, they are not uh, the types of activities that have uh, attracted tourists or the types of things that would promote tourism in the district. Uh, most of the activities that we have activated in the district are geared toward our own residents uh, and typical business activity in the district that are for um, us to be able to go about our daily activities. Um, this is an approach that we were very strategic about. Um, they don't necessarily draw people from uh, are not intended to advertise for people from those communities to come here. Uh, we have talked about if with a um, travel restriction from other communities, understanding how communities who have had those, there are some states who have had them for quite some time, what it takes for implementation and enforcement uh, if there is a decision to move in that direction. Uh, but we have not contemplated that because the activities that we have heretofore have not been attractive for residents from those other states. Uh, Mayor, I want to ask you about uh, the budget uh, Charles Allen has proposed. I asked you last week, you said you didn't want to comment until you saw it. Um, he reduced it by $15 million and then yesterday put out a thread on Twitter saying it's actually $33 million. And then he says this, in essence, unless money is transferred in by the mayor, there'll be an effective hiring freeze for new officers. Add attrition into the mix and force numbers will start to drop by about 200 officers. We're at 3,700 to 3,800 right now. What's your take on that? 
Um, I think that the that we have submitted a budget to the council that reflects what we need in public safety. Um, that includes policing, that includes job training, that includes um, all of our intervention efforts, that includes recreation, uh, and we think um, decreasing the police force in this rushed way. Uh, is uh, will have a negative impact on public safety. I'm sorry, so I hear you say increase or decrease? Decrease. You said decrease. Okay. So you're not in favor of this idea that you have. Uh, no, I'm not in favor of decreasing the police department with no consideration on how um, calls for service are going to be handled. So unless we are, they're also prepared to tell residents to stop calling 911, I'm not sure um, who's gonna respond to those calls. The police will continue to do it, but just recognize that it's gonna take longer. Uh, we're, I don't know that we're gonna have any dramatic decrease in the number of calls for service. We have, over the course of time, in fact, with more people, more businesses, different activities, we see our calls for service go up each and every year. Uh, this week, uh, as an, just as one example, we ha are encouraging residents to call 311 um, when they have concerns about illegal fireworks um, to take some of those calls off of 911. So I think that uh, we just have a, we are going to have to have a broader discussion over um, how long it will take to respond to calls. He um, also says his budget reinvests in violence prevention, victim services, emergency housing, alternatives to prosecutions, restorative justice programs, reentry supports, um, taking money away from the police department, putting it into those programs. So, do you see a big budget fight coming here with the council members and yourself? Um, the, count, I, the council members uh, have my budget. All of the agency directors have um, talked to members of the council. I, I got a chance to see some of their remarks yesterday, not all of them. I, I know they were meeting all day. Um, and one thing I failed to hear throughout those remarks is that we've balanced a budget after taking an $800 million decrease in revenues. So this idea that some programs were shaved here or shaved there is certainly true um, because that's what happens when you have to balance a budget uh, that got an $800 million hit and turn it around in two or three weeks. Um, so I think there will be changes that the council makes to the budget. They make changes uh, each and every year. Uh, but I think they have to be very mindful um, that, our, that we're in a recession that has been produced by COVID uh, and it could carry us into uh, next year. Um, although I'm very optimistic about our recovery, uh, we are going to be recovering uh, for a little while. Yes. Uh, if I could start with COVID. And sure. For Dr. Nesbitt, maybe she could answer this. Are, are you tracking... Or do you, can you give us data on the ages of people being hospitalized? And are you seeing what we heard uh, national experts talking about recently, that they're seeing an uptick in the number of younger people who are being hospitalized now around the country? Are we seeing that here in D.C.? Um, I can follow up with you on that. But as you know from our data, we are not seeing an increase in hospitalizations. Across the district. Age demographic. Oh, we are not seeing an increase in hospitalizations across the district, including in any specific demographic. Our trends remain the same in the district. And any update on phase three metrics? Uh, I, I don't understand your question. Can you tell us what the metric will be that hit phase three yet? I think, Mark, you understand that we posted on our dashboard last week. I did not see that. I okay. apologize. All right. Thank, Thank you. And it, it, Mayor Bowser, could I ask you a non-COVID question? But I, I am going to elaborate on that. You Please. do recall us uh, making it very clear to you last week that we do not anticipate that there is going to be a swift transition into phase three, given the complicated factors associated with needing to see more of our cases being linked to one another. And there needing to be a situation in the district where we do not have community 
uh, widespread community transmission, which is not currently the case. Uh, just because we have fewer cases uh, does not mean that we do not have widespread community transmission. When you still have 30 or so cases, but they are not linked to each other, the uh, mode of exposure cannot be identified for individuals. There is still great concern. And that should not be the picture in the district when we move into phase three. Thank you. Uh, uh, if I could ask, if I could go back to the police department. Uh -huh. uh, and if I could follow up on Sam's uh, questions about the tents. Um, you know, you, you said people are not allowed to live in tents in the district. Have you seen the video of the officers removing the tents? I've seen part of it, I think. So I guess going back to you saying that people are not allowed to stay in tents, but you allow the homeless to live in tents during Occupy DC because- We actually do not allow the homeless to live in tents. Uh, we remove encampments. We have a very strict code protocol about removing encampments and we do. I've told, I was told by your administration that that has currently been suspended. That protocol has been suspended for COVID. I don't know why anybody would have told you that. So you are currently removing homeless encampments? They should be, absolutely. It is illegal in the district to camp. And we offer, and this is why, we offer shelter. Every person um, that you see sleeping on the street uh, is offered and, is, and we have shelter available for them. A lot of the homeless are afraid to go to the shelters for fear of catching COVID. Uh, they should be afraid on the streets. It's not safe. It's unsanitary. Um, we have seen people die on the streets and going into the summer months, especially where I'm sure we will experience heat emergencies. Um, we've become very concerned about people uh, on the street. Uh, if I could stay on MPD uh, and ask about the Breitbart event at 2D, what is your reaction to that? You know, I am um, uh, as perplexed by it as uh, I've seen residents, uh, and it appears that uh, a community member went into our station um, and had an, a different agenda um, than what the police officers um, thought it was, uh, and certainly somebody on our in our PIO shop made a very bad mistake uh, in attaching uh, that a picture uh, or a post to Breitbart News, which we uh, totally disavow. Has there been any discipline for that person? Do you know who that person? That's is? something that we will handle internally, Mark, and continue to look at. Uh, and if I could ask one, one, one final question with uh, the movement on monuments and statues and naming and, and whatnot. Uh, recently, in the past couple of days, Princeton University has removed the name of Woodrow Wilson, the former president. There has been a movement for years to change the name of Woodrow Wilson High School here in the district. What is your, what is your position on changing the name of that school? It has been, and I think that the Wilson High School discussion uh, has probably been around longer um, than others. Um, I think there's an opportunity for us to kind of step back and look at any um, statues or other historical references like the naming of a school or rec center or any other types of things like that in the district and step back and look at them holistically. Um, I am tasking a group um, within DC government to kind of do some fact finding, gathering uh, information and make some recommendations to me. I anticipate that we'll have a broader community conversation uh, and then uh, move to act. So you say you're asking a task force looking at, is that specific to Wilson or is that just over the entire city? Over the entire city. Any historical reference, including uh, all the things you mentioned. Can I take one more swing at Wilson and just ask you, what is your personal opinion? Should the name of Wilson High School be changed? I think that um, it should be changed. Um, and I say that uh, reluctantly only for one reason. Uh, and that's because we have been through uh, this discussion with high schools and how people feel about their alma mater. Uh, and uh, attaching to uh, a lot of significance to uh, their alma mater. 
And I think that we have come in, th in this time uh, to an important um, moment where people are shedding uh, that attachment. And so uh, we know the, the legacy of President Wilson. Uh, I think that it has been appropriately disavowed. Um, it's particularly impactful here in the district. Um, at the seat of the federal government, um, his legacy of, in segregationist policy. So I think that we are in that moment. Um, I think that there may be a larger discussion uh, to, to have, and I think it is appropriate uh, to do it in an orderly way and to do it together. Yes, Sam. Uh, Mayor, the NDA, uh, NAACP is moving uh, to Washington. I think that, is that a done deal or is that um, we are very proud. Uh, I think uh, it, it, we, it was reported yesterday that we've reached a letter of intent, so an agreement in principle as to how the NAACP can move to the district. I want to thank my team at DEMPED, Deputy Mayor Falchicchio and his team um, for getting both sides, uh, our side and theirs, to, to some uh, agreement about how we would advance. It's something we've been working on uh, for a, a, a little bit, uh, and I, I'm proud to say that it's going to happen uh, at 14th and U. Uh, you know that we have uh, been uh, discussing for a number of years, actually before I became mayor, how the Reeves Center would be reimagined. Uh, it is a building uh, currently that holds a number of government agencies. It's an um, inefficient building in a number of ways, uh, and we want to see it reimagined. You know that Reeves at 14th and U was the brainchild of Mayor Marion Barry. If you haven't heard his story about how it came to be, I'll tell you one day, but he was um, very proud, and that building uh, started in many ways the renaissance of the 14th Street Corridor. So we know how important um, that building uh, has been um, in the provision of municipal services, and so we still envision some um, municipal service provision there, but it will become home to a venerated civil rights organization in the NAACP, so we're very proud of that. Um, DEMPED will be issuing uh, an RFP uh, shortly, uh, and uh, we will look for development partners to um, develop the building uh, with the NAACP. So I guess, Mayor, I'm curious, is it, are, you, are you taking the building down or altering it? Or, I, mean, um, I think uh, everybody thinks that there's no way to make it better, that it will have to come down and be rebuilt. Okay, so a new building. Then the other question is, who sought who? Did you seek the NAACP or did they seek D.C.? Um, I think uh, our early conversations involved uh, the NAACP looking to come to Washington, um, and we were looking to, to have them in Washington. Because I think our Baltimore station wanted to know, you know, did they want to leave Baltimore? Or <laughs> well, I won't get into that. I, I'll just say... Uh, who wouldn't want to move to the best city in the world? Uh, and uh, certainly having, we, we're home to a lot of associations that have a national reach. Uh, you know Frank Reeves' connection to the NAACP. And so it's just a one, it will be a wonderful marriage. Yes. It'll be a little bit longer before DC enters phase three because you're looking for sporadic um, cases. So how does that affect DC if the region around us is entering um, phase three while DC might not be for a while? You know, we've had several conversations in terms of our porous borders, uh, in terms of uh, the commuting patterns across the national capital region. Uh, it would be our hope that we would continue to make decisions across the national capital region uh, in concert with uh, individuals continuing to telework for as long as possible, uh, with us continuing to uh, de uh, de uh, delay uh, having high risk uh, activities such as bars and nightclubs and large venues uh, being operational uh, across the national capital region until we have 
uh, no to low evidence of community uh, transmission, widespread community transmission across the national capital region. So it's been a discussion among the region to keep those um, venues and those activities closed. We, we have ongoing cons uh, discussions across the national capital region and we will continue to do so. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, I know the nationals want to start training again and possibly as soon as tomorrow. Um, it's not a huge increase on that. Can you talk about what you need to do to get that waiver to train in the stadium and what is that group? Um, I think that we will be approving uh, their waiver today. And uh, there were just a few um, things. I mean, I, there's nothing remarkable. Great. Is that right, Chris? Yes. Ma yes. Yes, the nationals are, um, we will waive them for training uh, in games, no spectators. Okay. All right. So, Sorry. yes. Can you just clarify that? Because I thought their waiver application was simply for training. Uh, let me, let me, uh, let me ask Chris to yeah, talk about you. it. He's very familiar yeah. with it. <laughs> so thanks for the question, Mark. Um, the waiver, uh, the initial waiver was for was for training, and then of course MLB announcing that games would resume. Um, we had discussions with the Nationals on what that would look like. To the mayor's point, uh, no fans, um, no spectators, and so they um, submitted plans that uh, that we approved to have the games. And so, I'm, I get to press uh, other yes. ancillary needs would be allowed in there, just no fans in the stadium. That's correct. Yeah, right. That is correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Paul Wagner, do you do you have anything to tell us? <laughs> I have a question on that front. Okay, what's your question? And as are your thoughts on DC losing Another local reporter? Well, I didn't quite believe it when I heard it this morning um, because Paul is certainly a fixture in this press room and covering local news. Um, you will understand that if you're in my position and he has all these great sources and news before, you know, we make it news. Uh, we wonder how he does it day to day. Um, but we know he does it because he's honest. Um, and he is served with integrity. And the people um, who watch him uh, nightly or when he's on uh, appreciate the news that he's bringing. From our side, we appreciate him because he's honest. He serves with integrity. Uh, he gives us an opportunity to comment and respond. Uh, and he reports um, the facts. Uh, and uh, he gives the people the information uh, that, that we need. Uh, so certainly, he has earned uh, he has earned his retirement. Uh, we hope that you stay close, Paul. We will miss you, and we're going to see you around. Let's give a round to Paul Wagner and congratulate him on his retirement. Oh, I love it. We love you. Good luck to you. Stay around. I'm, okay. I'm going to keep my options open. Good for you. Uh, I, you know, I'm a storyteller at heart, and so uh, I, I hope to continue doing that in some form or fashion. And believe me, it's been a pleasure working in the city and uh, covering the news here and being able to shine a light on what's going on here. And um, I can't thank your staff enough. They've been terrific. And uh, you too, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. And I love it. You, you heard him. He's a storyteller at heart. So keep telling stories. Thank you, everybody.